thing to talk about here is a little bit about, uh, you know, honestly, what's going on with the oocytes and their development in terms of how they're being put together. Uh, Uh, oh, Genesis, again, we're dealing with a similar thing we are dealing with the male in that we have to get from a single, from a cell that has two copies of the genetic material to a cell that has a single copy. Uh, what's a little bit different about the females is the process over which this happens is not a quick one. Uh, in the fetus, you start initial mitosis, uh, certain processes of this development. So you're going to get to uh, these kind of stem cells of the oocytes. And still in the fetus, we're actually going to begin the formation of the primary oocytes. So we get to the primordial oocyte in the fetus. Uh, so at this point, they're at this stage. That primary oocyte, still in the fetus, starts to undergo through that first stage of meiosis, but gets blocked partway through. So all the egg cells that a female is going to have are present there in the fetus. And they start this process and are blocked in meiosis one until we get the onset of menstruation during puberty. In puberty, what's going to happen with each monthly cycle, we're going to take this primary oocyte and get it to a secondary oocyte. Uh, it generates what's called a polar body. Uh, unlike the males, primary oocyte is going to lead to one functional oocyte instead of a primary spermatocyte leading to four functional spermatozoa. Uh, this is mainly because early on in development, a lot of the cellular division is taking place with not a lot of growth in that zygote slash embryo. Because of this, the oocyte, the, we know the sperm cell is basically just genetic material strapped to a motor. All the organelles and everything else like that need to be in that oocyte. Because of this, we need a much larger cell. So what you get is this unequal division of the cytoplasm and organelles where you get what's called a polar body. This is going to happen early on here. If that secondary oocyte is then fertilized, it will make another polar body that will get sent away. And then what's left, these two nuclei will fuse and that will become the zygote. And that's only if it's fertilized does it undergo the second division here to do the second polar body. They then fuse together, and then you get that zygote, which has the 2N or 46 pairs of chromosomes nucleus, and that is going to become that embryo and then the fetus. If none of this happens, that secondary oocyte degenerates, and all this is going to be lost as menses. Uh, again, the main thing to realize, primary spermatocyte gets you four functional sex cells. Primary oocyte gets you a single functional sex cell. And this is kind of showing that idea and how you can see here you end up with one functional ovum and three polar bodies if everything went all the way to its final division. And you, see, you can kind of see is what's taking place with these divisions through the different parts of those different formation of those follicles that we were talking about. So you can kind of see here at ovulation we are getting that first division, completed division of meiosis 1. And meiosis 2 only completes if that is developed. This is also part of the reason that they talk about pregnancies later in life, so after 35 being a high risk pregnancy. Those oocytes and that genetic material has been present in this female for 35 years at that point. Uh, unlike the male sex cells that are continually being developed that are not as likely to pick up mutations and that's part of the reason they say that. Uh, again, before birth, you have all these diploid cells, 1.5 million follicles that are all in kind of stasis until puberty hits. Uh, some of those are going to kind of regress at, during childhood, but by puberty, you have about 400,000 follicles, not the messed up one here. Puberty to menopause, we are going to have this monthly cycle that takes place, and we're going to see this is this kind of pulse on release of gonadotropin releasing hormone that's going to stimulate FSH and LH and it's going to give us the cyclical pattern which is going to lead to in the ovary a, basically a three stage cycle where you're going to have the follicular stage, the ovulation taking place, and then the luteal phase. 
And in the rest of this show here, we're going to be taking a look at those different stages. So we can, and again, this is averages, uh, 28 day average. This is not always the case. Some women it is longer, some women it is shorter, some women it's, women it's irregular. Uh, but on average, it's about a 28 day cycle. The first half of that from one to 14 being the follicular phase. The second half of that being the luteal phase and ovulation taking place in the middle at about day 14. Uh, the follicular phase, how this starts out, and this is the kind of to me the more difficult part of this is this interplay between these hormones. But you're going to have the hypothalamus on day one releasing gonadotropin releasing hormone. Uh, this gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to stimulate the anterior pituitary to release its gonadotropins, FSH and LH, so follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. That FSH and LH are going to act on the primordial follicles and start getting some of those to develop. As these start to develop, those granulosa cells are making estrogen, and that estrogen is going to be released, and it's going to do a couple different things. One of the things it's going to do is going to lead to further development of the stratum functionalis of the uterus to prep it for a possible pregnancy. The other thing that estrogen does is it stimulates the anterior pituitary to make more of FSH and LH, but not to release it. So then the second half of this follicular phase, we are know that we're stimulating this follicular cells to make more and more estrogen. Estrogen levels continue to rise in the blood, continue to rise in the blood. What this is going to do is because it's causing the pituitary to make it but not release FSH and LH, FSH levels and LH levels are going to continue to fall. What we're setting up here is kind of survivor follicle addition. And what's going on here is only those follicles that respond best to the low levels of FSH are going to continue to develop and continue to cause estrogen levels to rise. But what we're doing is narrowing down the number of follicles that are going to develop so we don't get a litter of children, but a single one. Uh, those estrogen levels continue to rise, continue to rise. FSH and LH levels continue to drop, continue to drop. And generally what we're going to see is only one follicle between both ovaries tends to reach to that graphene stage. At about midpoint here at the ovulation, whenever ovulation happens, what happens is the estrogen levels will build up to a point now that they reach a threshold. And this threshold causes all that stored FSH and LH to be released. And it's really the surge of LH that is going to do a few things. It causes the primary oocyte to finish its meiosis 1 and make that oocyte. It causes that oocyte to be ovulated. And it's also going to convert those remaining cells in the follicle to the corpus luteum. So now we have this oocyte that's going to be traveling down the fallopian tubes. But what we're going to stay focused on is what's happening in the ovary still. But this kind of shows you what's going on here. We have the gonadotropin releasing hormone, causes FH and LH release. Estrogen levels feed back, inhibit the release of these ones. Sooner or later, we reach a threshold with high estrogen level, causes the surge here of FSH and LH, which causes the ovulation to happen and the cells that are left here to become the corpus luteum. And we're going to see this is now going to feed back up on here in the second half. And we'll work through that now. And it shows you what's happened with the ovary and the different follicle stages. And this, you can kind of see the estrogen levels, how they went up, how that inhibited the release here. Then they reached that threshold and you get the spike of these and what's happening in terms of the oocyte at this point. We haven't got into the second half here of this, the, uh, the luteal phase. This is talking about what's going on at the uterus. We'll come back and hit that in the last show. But again, you can see that estrogen reaches a threshold, causes the spike of LH and FSH. And we're gonna see in the second half, progesterone is gonna be a bigger player in this. So, now that we have had this ovulation take place, those cells that were left in the, cor in the follicle become the corpus luteum. They now start secreting large levels of progesterone. What the progesterone is going to do is it does a couple of things. Again, acts on the uterus, makes it more vascular, more glandular, more ready for a possible implantation of an embryo. The other thing that this is going to do is it's going to feed back up to the pituitary and inhibit any release of LH and FSH. 
This means that only one, whatever was already ovulated, is the only thing that can develop in the uterus. The uterus is kind of a single-use housing. We can't have uh, embryos at different stages and planting at different times because when that uterus gets emptied out during pre uh, childbirth, it is going to empty everything out, everything that's in there. Uh, because of that, we only want one fetus developing at a time or fetuses of the same if more than one, uh, like twins, triplets were to occur, you want them all to be at the same level of development during that time period. So no other ovulation is going to take place during this. Again, as progesterone levels rise higher and higher, plasma LH levels fall lower and lower. If LH levels get low enough, what's going to happen is the corpus luteum is no longer going to be able to be maintained. At that point, it begins to degenerate, become that corpus albicans. As that happens, progesterone levels are going to drop. If progesterone levels drop low enough, what's going to happen is the uterus can no longer be maintained, so that uterine lining is going to be shed, and that is what menstruation is. Uh, the other thing that's going to happen is once those progesterone levels drop low enough, we are going to get gonadotropin-releasing hormone to, say, release FSH and LH and trigger the next cycle. And this is showing kind of the ovary with the ovulated follicle. So first thing is what happens with pregnancy? So how does this stay going here? Pregnancy, if that embryo is, if that zygote is formed and it leads to implant, those initial cells that implant in here start making something called human chorionic gonadotropin. This is something that's called HCG. It's what the pregnancy test actually looks for the presence of because we will expel this in the urine. Structurally, this acts like LH. And if we have LH present, we can maintain the corpus luteum, which maintains progesterone levels, which maintains the uterus, and also stops us from developing any further follicles at that point. And for about the first trimester of the pregnancy, it is this, LA, this HCG release and its resemblance to LH that maintains the progesterone necessary to maintain the pregnancy. By the beginning of that second trimester, the uh, uterus, not the uterus, but the placenta is developed enough that it begins taking over the production of the esterone and progesterone for the later parts of pregnancy. So how does the pill work? Or how does contraceptive, at least in some levels here, work? Uh, again, rhythm method is just this idea that you only, you don't have relations during the time frames that you could get pregnant where you'd be ovulating or there a little bit before or after. Barrier methods uh, like uh, diaphragms or IUDs, those are actually inserted in there to block the sperm from ever getting to the egg cell. Uh, whereas the lactation also is going to tone down ovulation. But when we start actually talking about oral contraceptives, these are progesterone mimics. What they're doing is releasing just enough progesterone that you're uh, basically your pituitary and your hypothalamus think you're pregnant. So they're releasing just enough that you don't release any FSH and LH, which means you're not going to develop an, a, a follicle and therefore are not going to get pregnant. What happens when you miss a pill on those ones like that and where sometimes people can get pregnant or even when they're on the pill is again, these are minimal levels of progesterone. If you miss that, if those progesterone levels drop low enough, we go back to, they reach a low enough threshold. If the progesterone levels drop enough, pituitary gland releases FSH and LH, and then you're back into survival of the fittest follicle. And it is possible in some women for that development to take place with almost no other estrogen or progesterone being blocked again by the taking of these pills later on. Uh, but again, that is how those oral contraceptives work. They really prevent ovulation from happening because the body pretty much thinks you're pregnant already. Uh, again, much like the vasectomy in the male, you can also cut the tubes in the female and this would stop the sperm from ever getting up to the egg cells. Uh, this is actually incorrect what I'm saying there. Tubal ligation is not preventing the sperm from reaching, from reaching uterus. It is actually preventing the egg cells from getting down and making their way to the uterus. 
So with really the last thing we're going to be talking about here, and this will be it, is we will actually talk about the uterine cycle and what takes place during that. And then we'll be done with all of our material.